Like, if you're a basketball player and you grow and gain 10 pounds, you can't be a man. In fact, that's probably good for you. <laughs> but, you know, wrestling. God is good. And all the time. Amen, hey, my friends. A few announcements as you can see on the screen behind me, or of course, follow along in your programs as well. If you're a guest today, we'd love for you to fill out one of our guest cards. On the flip side of that is our prayer card. If you have a prayer request, please fill that out as well. Drop off that card in the offering plate at that time of service. There is youth group tonight, 6.30 p.m. here at the church. A couple weeks we'll be working on ice skating or so. That's what we have planned so far. So details for that to come. Meanwhile, our overnighter for 4th through 6th graders will occur May 4th through 5th. That is, of course, May the 4th be with you for Star Wars and Cinco de Mayo. So that should be quite fascinating with 4th through 6th graders in Wesley Woods. Oh, boy. We'll move on from that. It should be a blast. But if I'm dragging on May 6th on that Sunday morning, you'll know why. Meanwhile, archery tag for our young adults was rescheduled for May 19th. Uh, because of incredibly wet conditions at Bill's Field of Stream. So that's rescheduled from May 19th to the 4 p.m. If you're part of the craft group or would like to come out, they will be working on crafts tomorrow. They just need you to sign up for um, so that they can make sure they bring their cinder blocks, and not for everyone. I have no clue what they're doing with cinder blocks. I'm worried about my personal health. When I start talking about cinder blocks, we'll see what that is, but that will be tomorrow. Make sure you sign up downstairs in the main hall. Cope will be sponsoring a town hall meeting here at the church Wednesday night at 6.30 p.m. Um, looks like some great speakers, so come on out. That is Wednesday night at 6.30 p.m. And for our summer ser sermon series, we'll be looking at those questions you've always been afraid to ask. Which means if you have a question about the scriptures, some, something theological, you may wonder why we do what we do here in church. Um, or if you have some other idea for uh, something for us to speak about or talk about on a Sunday morning, drop off those ideas, whether it be by email or posting to the Facebook page, or if you'd like to tell me in person, or if you'd like to drop off a note anonymously, whatever works for you. Um, but that's what we're looking to here in the future. And for a moment of recognition this morning, I want to make sure I say thank you to Rodney, as well as John Lyon. Rodney dropped off the lawnmowers and the snowblower. John White dropped off the lawnmowers back at the Parsonage. We're still waiting on the snowblower, and we've had almost a foot of snow since they took the snowblower into the shop. So I'm just saying, either way, as well as for Dale, for the work he's done on the uh, snowblowers and servicing the lawnmowers here for the church. And also thanks to Dale, who cleaned up quite a bit this morning, as well as many other folks after the 9 o'clock service. We had some insulation from the ceiling above start to trickle down. Um, now everybody's looking out to see if there's more coming. I saw all your gazes. <laughs> it's not the first time it's trickled down, and it probably won't be the last time until we renovate the ceiling, but um, it was, if nothing else, a reminder of the work that needs to be done in here, too. And thanks to Adele and everyone else who's been done. As well as thanks to uh, Bill Probst, as well as Brad Bridges, when um, they, they made sure that the new dehumidifiers for the preschool put in downstairs and put in well. And finally, I want to make a couple mentions, although I'll probably miss someone here, but um, I do know this, Megan Reed, who right now is with our kids in the nursery, Megan was one of the seniors uh, commended for her outstanding performance at Mercer County Career Center. She was nominated for an outstanding senior for 2018. And, um, and then also for Ian Titus, who's um, in the back row hiding right behind Bob Fall, which means, of course, yeah, everybody knows where you are, Ian. <laughs> that um, Ian was represented Mercer High School in the Extreme Leadership Program throughout the 2017-2018 high school year. So, Ian, well done. <laughs> Friends, let's greet one another with the love of Christ. They didn't have leadership when I was
Well, yeah, he, he, he got a microphone. Oh, that's right. He's special. Unless he has someone else coming to speak. Yeah, they just need to speak. That's right. I don't know
also on the screen behind me. <coughs> but what do you believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead, he ascended to heaven, and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. My friends, whoa. Pardon, my friends, please be seated.
forward, that'd be a great thing. <coughs> Morning, Cameron. Hey, Cameron, do you like old stuff? You don't know? See, I've got some Gatorade I found on my back porch. You've seen those bottles, you know? Do you like Gatorade? The, my, the Gatorade I found on the back porch, though, it expired four months ago. Uh, <laughs> you, ever, you ever accidentally drink milk that was a little chunky? No? Good job, Mom. Because um, I've accidentally done that. It's not a pleasant thing. It's sort of like milk that's got cottage cheese in it. It doesn't, yeah, but it smells bad. Yeah, there's some things that when they go bad, they just are not good. But if you want, I can get you the Gatorade. It's only four months old, expired. <laughs> Cameron, you don't look like you want to take that gift from me, do you? Yeah, there's some things that you just do not want when they're way too old. Like, um, you ever, in your refrigerator, you ever find something in there that was um, that not too pretty? Like, we had, um, we had tomato paste and it looked red like tomatoes. Multiple times, Tina and I will lose in the refrigerator, and I'll be coming out green. Yeah. Do you want me to bring that in for you? You do? No. No, because we don't want to eat that. There are a lot of things that when they go bad, they aren't good for you. The neat thing, though, is when Jesus doesn't go bad. What did we celebrate two weeks ago? Do you remember? Great job, Kim. That's right. We celebrated Easter. So I've got leftovers for you from Easter. Like the eggs I, Tina and I hid around the house, the hard-boiled eggs. <laughs> They're only two weeks old. No, smart girl. That's not what's in there at all. We have other eggs. But instead, Cameron, the one thing that, we're, that I was thinking about getting ready for today is that at least with Jesus, things don't get old. From uh, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, it puts it this way. For Christ Jesus died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. In other words, he did it once, and it's done. It's not going to get old. It's like new every day. The fact that Jesus died for you and for me. So, milk, get bad. Tomato paste in the fridge. Mm. Those eggs that you maybe hit around the house, the hard-boiled ones. We found one in my house growing up. We found it from Easter in August. Oh. <laughs> Do you know where we had found it? My dad had hid it inside one of the registers for the heat. Uh, in August, you know how we found it? Oh. <laughs> Ooh, that smell. Yeah, it was bad. Yeah, there are some things that can go bad quickly, but because Jesus rose from the dead, that news doesn't. So let's pray. Thank you, Father, that Jesus paid the price for us and that it never gets old. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, well, Cameron, I've got leftovers here, though, for you. If you like Sour Patch Kids, I've got Sour Patch Bunnies, I've got Reese Eggs, and I have gummy carrots we gave up last Sunday. Whatever you like, kiddo. Or if you want more than one, you can even get the carrots with vegetables. Think about that. <laughs> Friends, is there anything we need to be praying for? Anything you want to thank God for? Or anything you want to praise God for? Who can I do this? Marianne. My husband has decided to have the ostomy surgery in May, so that's a good thing. Thank you, Lord. What's the ostomy surgery for, Marianne? It's colon cancer. For everybody else's sake. All right, so let's be praying for Finn. I'll be having ostomy surgery in May in this battle with colon cancer. Thanks, Mary. How are uh, Kate and the family doing? Everybody's doing fine, but they're looking forward to me coming and taking the night shift on the beating. So, <laughs> so wait, you travel all the way down there and get with the night shift? Yeah. You were one loving mom. You volunteered. You volunteered. Okay. Awesome. Okay. Friends, is there anything else you want to thank God for? Praise God for who God is. Denise. Prayers for the men of family. Um, about five weeks ago, they lost Paul and the other day they lost another brother, Dave. So that's for the men of family? Okay. Thanks, Denise. We're praying for them. 
who have lost two, do I have this right, two brothers in the last few weeks? Wow. Friends, is there anything else? Um, you want to thank God for it. Praise God for who God is. Marianne. I think we ought to all be praying for all those who are living with addiction. Whether it's those who are addicted or their family members or whatever. <coughs> I agree, Mary. Amen to that. Thank you. Friends, is there anything else? Kathy? I uh, would just ask for prayers and So in the midst of the joyous time for his daughter being married, James Riley with um, Lou Gehrig's disease is even worse. Do I have yeah, that right? He, he is already, you know, um, has to use machine to talk. And okay. So, <coughs> like, so pray for James Riley in the midst of his battle with Lou Gehrig's. Okay. Thanks, Kathy. Thank Friends, is there anything else you want to thank God for? Praise God for who God is. Couple things. One, um, Susan Spears's nephew TJ, who we mentioned last week, who had lost his arm. The arm's been reattached, but it's still a long process. Hoping that the arm will actually be usable and not just there. But to be praying for TJ in the midst of this, I can't even imagine this. Um, the attempts at therapy and to deal with life, well, everything else that goes into your life in that radically changed. And also, Mark's brother Terry, who we were praying for, is doing much better. Was even able to be at home by himself. But also, I want to lift Mark up because he'll be um, at least with, because of work, be moving to West Virginia. So Mark's been willing to sing in the cantata and the choir here, and wherever else Sue suckers. Did I say that out loud? That's about it. That's about it. So in the midst of this um, job change, we praying for Mark as well. Mark, you've been a gift. Thank you. Thank you. Friends, is there anything else? You want to thank God for praise God for who God is, Glenda. I just really appreciate the last couple of days of weather. I felt we all need to pray <clears> that <throat> and certainly lifted me up on the third day. Mm -hmm. I agree with what a gift the weather was. I was stuck in training Thursday and Friday, but it was nice to go outside and see what everybody else was able to enjoy. <laughs> yeah, I agree with you, Glenda. Thank you. Friends, let's go to the Lord together in prayer. Behold, I am making all things new. Jesus, you say that, at least we read in the book of Revelation, however that came about. We're thanking you that you're in the business of making all things new. And yet we can turn you into a boring individual. Father, forgive us. Move in our hearts to see the wonder and joy of life live with you. If you're the one who will lead us by your Holy Spirit as though, as though it's someone being blown around like the wind, then why in the world do we allow you to be boring? Father, we thank you for how you move and work in our lives, period, in our lives, that you, God, are moving and active, that you've never left us alone, that you constantly care and love for us. What a gift it is to be loved by you, the creator of heaven and earth, and you love us, that you continue to move and work in our lives. Unlike the milk that's gone bad in the fridge or the leftovers we lose track of or the Gatorade in the back porch, you do not become we sometimes can celebrate you. It doesn't matter whether it's a new worship service, contemporary worship, traditional. We can turn you into old or outdated or boring. Forgive us, Father. Jesus obviously shows us that life with you is not boring. Tables being thrown, late night prayer sessions, talking with people, dealing with accusers. Forgive us, Father, for how we can turn you into boring. Forgive us how we individually and treat you as whole hum. You are the God who moves and works in our midst. If you're the one who's somehow in this incredible way helped TJ's arm to be reattached and spite, with the surgery and whatnot, let alone for everything to have worked so far, we give you thanks. We pray for continued healing in Jesus' name. We're thanking you, Father, for providing for Mark with the new job in West Virginia. What a gift. 
prepare the way. It's in Jesus' name we pray. We thank you so much for how you've um, moved in Finley's heart the desire to have the ostomy surgery in May, let alone the opportunity for Marianne to go see Renee and the family in Mexico and be able to serve in the midnight ship. What a gift. We thank you in Jesus' name. We thank you for the gift that the weather is. How incredibly tied to the weather that we are as human beings. Thank you for the beauty of the last few days and that the snow's gone. What a gift. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And Father, we also come before you and we're asking you to change breath. Give us strength and his family perseverance in the midst of his battle with Luke Garris' disease and his daughter's upcoming wedding. Father, we pray for those moments where James is able to be there in the way that he can. We're asking for this in Jesus' name. We ask, Father, that you do with the men or family in the midst of losing two brothers in, in just a rather month's time. We're praying, Father, for your spirit of comfort and peace to be with the men or family. And we ask for this in Jesus' name. Father, thank you for any good work in our lives. Thank you for how alive and powerful you are. Thank you, Father, that with you all things are possible and that you're in the business of making all things new. We thank you and praise you as we pray as Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Poor Marianne. Our scripture lessons this morning come from 1 Peter chapter 3 and Luke chapter 16. Peter 3, 18 through 22. For Christ also suffered for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. After being made alive, he went and made proclamation to the imprisoned spirits, to those who were disobedient long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. For it only, in it only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience towards God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand, with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. Luke 16, 19-31 There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen, and lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores. And longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table, even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things. But well, Lazarus received bad things, but now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. And besides all this, heaven, all this between us and you is a great chasm. It's been set in place so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. He answered, then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my family, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them so that they will not also come to this place of torment. 
Abraham replied, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. He said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. Friends, it's the word of God, the people of God. Thank you, God. And let's stand together. You're ready. Did Jesus descend to hell? 
Theologically, I can make that argument. He paid the price for you and for me on the cross. I deserve hell. I deserve punishment. Thanks be to God. By God's grace, he took my place. He took your place. But we're not sure 1 Peter 3 means that Jesus went to hell. Three options that most theologians agree with. Number one, Jesus did descend to hell. Church fathers like Clement, or Clement, that's how you want to say it, as well as Origen, suggested that Jesus descended into hell. And they call it the harrowing of hell, or the census ad infernos, where Jesus preached to bring about salvation to all people in hell. That's the first option. Second option is this. Jesus preached to those who died in the days of Noah, but through Noah, I don't know how that happened. A few church fathers believed in that, including Augustine and Aquinas, and some other church fathers during the Protestant Reformation. The third one, which is where I line up, is this. This is Jesus' victory proclamation following the resurrection. What's lost in our translation we read this morning is the, the Greek language hints that Jesus rose up from the grave and then descended to speak to those. And so the suggestion would be after he ascended into heaven while alive, after um, he rose from the dead, then Jesus, in some sort of victory proclamation, spoke to those imprisoned from the days of Noah. But why the folks from the days of Noah? That doesn't make much sense. Why did they pinpoint? What did they do? Scriptures seem to indicate in much of the Old Testament, let alone books that were written about the Old Testament, like the book of Enoch. That's another thing. If you want to read it, go ahead. It still doesn't make more sense to me. But it does suggest that those people who died in the days of Noah, before the flood, the scriptures are indicating that they were the worst of the worst. They were the poster child for how not to do things. We talk about the days of Sodom and Gomorrah. We can speak about the days of Caligula or Roman um, lascivious lifestyles. The scriptures indicate the folks who died in the days of Noah, they were the worst. They were the, they were the ones that it seemed like God just wanted to reboot and start all over. Like God wanted to wipe everyone out. And if you read through Genesis chapters 5 and 6 and whatnot, it indicates that Noah was the only one who measured up at all about being righteous. That God just wanted to hit the reboot button. Now, if you come to the church and you're here, I bet you'll hear me about once a week this, this um, how do I say this, ascribing my displeasure with the church computer in my office. <laughs> it's not because the church bought a back computer, it's with all the video editing software I have on there for the videos we take for worship, it slows the thing down. This morning, when I needed to get on the computer, in my mind, at least, early and quickly, the computer decided when to sleep in. For those of you who don't work with computers often, think about your spouse or little kids when they wake up from a nap, and you know how some of them, they just bounce right up, ready to go. Or my nephew, Braden, when he was three or four, we had a good 20 to 30 minutes of crying before he was ready to roll. Much better now, but 10 years ago, it's another ball of wax. That's why this with my church computer. I want to throw it out the window. I shouldn't say that out loud. Should I? I shouldn't tell you what I want to do with the computer, but there are days where the sucker just makes me get a little cranky. You want to throw it out. Then I just want to start over. Unlike the computer, these human beings chose to rebel against God. The suggestion would be is the worst of the worst that ever were, Jesus proclaimed his victory over death. That's what the language about baptism and water and, and whatnot comes into play as well as it connects with, uh, with Noah. This idea of death to life. And that Jesus, just like with baptism, Jesus rising from the dead to life. That being said, 1 Peter chapter 3 is the only passage that I can find that suggests that Jesus actually descended to hell or descended into the, de the dead to preach to the dead. My guess is the original point of the Apostles' Creed was not to say that Jesus descended to hell, per se, but instead that he descended to death for us. But it's been removed if for no other reason, in part because we say this, I believe in Jesus Christ, who was crucified, dead, and buried. They were, when they first wrote it, many commentators believe that it's just an exclamation point. He descended to the dead. Not to dead beings, but he died. But I don't know that for sure. I don't have the absolute answers. 
You may have been frustrated with the Apostles' Creed sermon series here as we've talked about the Apostles' Creed and used Adam Hamilton's book, Creed, as a background, but there are times where I'm just stuck with my favorite three words or four words because it's really a conjunction, where my answer might be, what do I absolutely know here? Well, guess what? About this, whether Jesus descended to the dead or to hell or not, my ultimate answer is, I don't know. My best guess is this. Jesus didn't descend to hell, at least according to the scriptures. But theologically, he paid the price for me. And if we take a light view of sin in our own lives, maybe that's where we get squeamish. Maybe that's why we don't like to talk about hell. Because we have to deal with the reality of how wicked we can be. I don't know about hell being real or not. I have my ideas. But I do know this. That I believe in Jesus Christ. Who died for me. I believe in Jesus Christ, but you may or may not believe in hell. We have a video here that's going to help us at least think a little bit about that. So, Kale, if you don't mind. When you die, you die. There's no more life in the body. I just think that's it. You know, I have a very scientific point of view on it. Very good just. Uh, they get cremated, they get buried, they donate their parts to science. We fall asleep forever, but we don't know. It's a mystery, it's a surprise. We were produced by evolution. We don't go to anywhere. I think it's like before we were born, you know? Heaven is for those who uh, repent and uh, feel like they atone for their sins and then they go up to heaven. I believe that we go into like this guy, like as clouds or stars. I think if you're a good person, and you're an honest person, I think that you probably will go to heaven, right? I'm not saying it doesn't exist, I'm saying I don't know. And I think the people who talk about it with certainty don't know. I think it's nice to believe in that, because it makes you feel hopeful. I believe heaven is a place that we'll be going after uh, after we die. Um, if you commit to Jesus as your personal savior. I don't believe in hell because it doesn't exist. I don't believe hell is a real place. I believe that the hell could be here. Uh, I don't want to go there. I think hell definitely does exist. There's hell on earth, there's hell in the afterlife. Because if there has to be a heaven, and we all hope that there is, there has to be an opposite of that. Maybe not like fire and like brimstone, like you think, but more of like a state of mind. I think that's a really horrible thought, and nobody on earth would be that horrible, and they shouldn't have to deal with that either. I feel like hell's probably more like a time out from heaven, as opposed to somewhere where he sends people to suffer for eternity. Because like you said, I don't know how a, a loving God could I think it's the, the person's decision. Um, I think people send themselves to hell because he gave us free will, so... Depends on who they're sending. I mean, you know, I don't have a problem with Hitler going to hell. I mean, you know, what's the downside of that? Well, uh, if someone has done something really, really bad, like killed someone, so probably you will be sent to hell. It, it's funny, they say God is almighty and all-powerful, but then they're saying, why would God do this? If he's almighty and all-powerful, why are you questioning him? You know, he does what he does, or she does what she does, or it does what it does, you know. We make the decision, and once we receive Christ into our hearts, then we will go to heaven. Everybody has a second chance every day. So many different ideas out there about what hell might be. Where do I go for answers? Scriptures, but that's all I'm wired. Um, and so that's one reason why we look at, as well, as a um, passage from Luke this morning about what might hell look like? But we have to be cautious here. The language in our text this morning, as Mary Ann read for us so well, is it has it's full of imagery. And imagery at times can be metaphorical, and at times it will actually happen. And so what parts of this do I know are part of hell and what aren't? I don't know. But enough is mentioned about suffering and even worse, separation from Jesus Christ with hell, um, that we at least need to look at this. Some options about hell, which you can even make a theological argument for a few of these. One, hell is a real destination with suffering. And often we point heaven up, hell down, because Jesus rose towards heaven, so hell would be down. I don't know if that's exactly the location on the map, but either way, hell is a real destination with suffering. Or, hell is a real destination without suffering, but if there is suffering, it's separation from Jesus Christ. Or, Hell is eternal non-existence. 
theologically you can make the point that hell is a place which isn't a place because you just cease to exist. Some would say because scriptures such as from 1 John chapter 3, God is love. And if God is love, how could there be a hell? My suggestion would be God lets us choose. Thanks be to God for all of God giving us free will. We can choose where to go. But there are those who make the argument hell is a non-existent state. Finally, those who would just say hell's fake, as we saw in the video here. Some folks just don't think about it. And a side note, as we watched the video again this morning, I was reminded of my dad. Um, years ago when we were teenagers and I was trying, and trying to share the gospel with him, he mentioned at once, well, Brian, when you die, you just die, you cease to exist. And then my dad had terminal brain cancer. And that went from, but the lung cancer, I should say, that was terminal with the tumors in his brain, where he went from that to, he suddenly wanted me to be his pastor. And my thought was, well, dad, if you just cease to exist, why do you need a preacher? You're just going to cease if that's where you are. People change. We'll get to more of that in a bit. Either way, folks, well, even those who say that you just cease to exist for many of the kids there in the video, the older you get, the more you realize death is reality, the more I hope people start to think. For me, I believe hell is a real place. I believe it's a destination. I don't want to. I'd rather believe that there is non-existence or that everybody went to heaven, but that's not what the scriptures indicate. Images of hell include burning sulfur, fire, furnace, the abyss, where it's described with thick smoke and locusts who sound like they're demons and they sting you like scorpions. I've never been stung by a steam scorpion, although we almost had a wasp get somebody. Thank you, Kale, for being our wasp killer. He's up for rent. <laughs> I don't think Kale, yeah, you don't need any more work, do you? So hell's also described with condemnation, darkness with weeping and gnashing of teeth, Destruction, eternal punishment, Gehenna, which was also the, the, the local trash heap which was constantly burning outside of Jerusalem. It was a disgusting place as far as I can read. Um, Hell's described as being a lake of fire, the second death, and ultimately an exclusion from God's presence. What didn't make it into my notes this, this morning, though, was also in the Old Testament, and especially hell is described of as a place where you reside. My battery just went out, Merle. Anyhow, I'll just get louder. Everybody's so thankful when I do that. Where um, hell is a place where you spend a lot of time with worms. So a few different places where that shows up here. Please forgive me as I read on my phone. One is from Job chapter 7, verse 5. My flesh is clothed with worms and clods of dust. My skin is broken and become, have and become a loathsome. Although Job 17, verse 14 puts it better. I said to the pit, thou art my father. To the worms, my mother and my sister. Even if Job in those passages is speaking more about the suffering he's going through, some theologians believe he's also pointing at the idea of what hell is like. From Psalm 49, death will give them their food like sheep. The underworld is their fate, and they will go down into it. Their flesh is food for worms. Their form is wasted away. The underworld is their resting place forever. Psalms are actually full of places where it speaks about somehow the the resting place for the wicked is filled with worms. Isaiah chapter, I'm going to skip Isaiah because I can't read my own handwriting. Please forgive me. And then Mark 9, 44. In that place, worms never die and the fire is never put out. And it says the same thing in Mark 9, 46. This idea that hell also has to do with worms. I'm not sure if this is earthworms <laughs> or maggots. That's my guess. Whatever it might be, this is not the place you want to be. If you're thinking that's not so bad, Watch something like Fear Factor whenever I was a teenager growing up and I had kids eating worms or you're crawling around in a cesspool of worms or watching Indiana Jones in the Temple of Doom movie with all the bugs all over the place. That's a little creepy. <coughs> and now everybody's disgusted by what I just said or even more so what I've actually put into my mind. Nothing else you find that a little weird. Just go fishing this weekend. Maybe go trout fishing if you got real worms there or maggots there for, you know, bait. Just pour them on your hand and see how that feels. No takers. Y'all are just like, Brian, this is a serious subject. And it really is. That being said, hell seems to be a location which is not the place you want to be. Luke 16, 19 through 31, and what it says about hell points us to a few things. One from this passage that we can cling to, because it's a parable, there is imagery, and a read into parables can be dangerous. What we can see is this. There's Lazarus, the poor man, 
who had the weeping sores on his outside, which meant nobody wanted to go see him. And he's a beggar who would eat to eat the food from the rich man's table. Both die. Lazarus, eternal life. The rich man, death. And the point of the parable seems to be this. I guess you reap what you sow. The rich man, who everybody thought was neat or cool or impressive, didn't care enough about the man who lived right outside of his gates and walked by him every day. Think about that. He ignored Lazarus every day. Lazarus was nothing more than a garbage can. Where Tina and I used to live in uh, Clymer, Pennsylvania, we were driving to her mom's in Slippery Rocks for, um, for a Memorial Day picnic. So we were driving there on Route 422 and right outside of Catanning, Pennsylvania, which is it's sort of a back road, even though it's Route 422 area. Lost a tire. I shouldn't say lost a tire. We had a flat. Let me put it that way. Pulled over to the side of the road right at the edge of somebody's driveway. I had decent clothing on, so I didn't roll, roll around on the ground too much to change the tire, but working on changing the tire there, right at the edge of someone's driveway, and then the owner of the house started to pull down their car. And I'm thinking, this is great. They're going to help. They're, this, they may have something here that would be wonderful, nothing else. You know, they may help with traffic or whatnot, as folks would drive in that 45-mile-an-hour speed limit zone, and so they're trying to run you down and go on 60 or 70. Nope, she just pulled down the driveway. I don't even know if she looked at me. I really don't think she even looked. She, we were on the right-hand side of her driveway. She made a left-hand turn out of her driveway. I don't even think she looked to see if cars were coming or not. She just wanted to get away from us as soon as possible. As we were parked outside of her house, she ignored us completely. I have an idea of what maybe someone like Lazarus would feel. You're useless. You're nothing but a garbage can. Lazarus, day by day, was outside of this man's house. They both died. And Lazarus goes to heaven. It's greeted by Father Abraham, which for Jewish folks would mean that he was someone who was of Jewish worth. Meanwhile, the rich man went to hell. He sent it to Hades, is what the technical wording here would be in our, in our in Greek here, but the Hades becomes hell. We'll leave it there. The rich guy everybody thought was impressive. Hell. We see suffering, we see heat, he's aching for a glass of water, and when he finally finds Lazarus of worth, he says to Father Abraham, send Lazarus to get me some water, please. Nope. Well, send Lazarus to tell my brothers. Nope. They, if they wouldn't, let's get this straight. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. And he said to them, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. It does seem like there's some sort of suffering. It does seem like in our parable here that the rich man didn't show enough caring for someone else, that that's where he ends up. That instead of heaven, he ends up in hell. And that ultimately this chasm the separation from God is an eternal thing that comes with hell. The metaphorical may be true and may not be true about the, the sulfur and the fire described, this broad and physical expanse between heaven and hell, that Abraham's the gatekeeper between us. I think that's the least likely of the possibilities, just like many of our jokes might have Peter waiting for us at the pearly gates. Most likely, not a reality. We can see here is that hell is a place we want to be. One reason why we spent so much time talking about the Apostles' Creed and emphasis the last few weeks on heaven is that that is the place we want to be. Hell is not. For Christ also suffered once for, for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. The reminder here, my friends, if you know of someone who doesn't know Jesus Christ, As far as I can read the scriptures, and I don't even want to say it, as far as I can read, hell is their destiny. This is terrifying. Even if hell is non-existent, that means that person no longer exists. You need to treat this with respect. You may not agree with me. You don't have to. But when Jesus speaks about hell as much as money in the kingdom of God, more than he talked about forgiveness of sins, more than you talk about this resurrection from the dead, that 
tells me Jesus finds hell important. Your assignment for this week, well, this is fun. Merle, by the way, thank you so much for what you've done here to make me even hearable all the time this morning. Your assignment this week, my friends, is pray for someone you fear does not know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Pray specifically for a chance to tell them about your relationship with Jesus. Pray for it. Here's what I do. Just between us, I pray for it, then I practice what I may say, and don't expect that I'll anything I say I'll ever say, or anything I practice I'll ever say. I'm supposed to have this all down packed, because you know, I'm an expert, I've practiced, went to seminary, I squeezed three years of school into ten years. I is that kind of student. <laughs> Henceforth, if you think you don't have all the answers, neither do I. Some things like about hell here ultimately, what do I absolutely know? Well, I can give you my answer. I don't know. My, as far as I can tell from the scriptures, this is what they say. That there is a real hell, that there is suffering. Ultimately, the worst part is the fact that we are separated from Jesus Christ. That's your assignment for this week. But why pray? No, Father Abraham, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. Father Abraham said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, in other words, if they won't listen to the Bible, they will not be convinced even if someone rises from for us Christians, we claim that Jesus <clears throat> rising from the dead. That means God can do anything. Why did Jesus die in the first place? To pay the price for you and for me. Thanks be to God who was willing to do that. Thanks be to God. It's about God's grace for us. We've talked a lot about hell today, my friends, but what is more important? Heaven or hell? It's so much more important about what we have promised to us than what is against but even heaven is not the great thing. It's this incredible love of God that we see in Jesus Christ. That Jesus would pay the price for us because I'm saved by. Grace. Good morning. How's everybody doing? You didn't think I sneaked that in there on you, did you? You are welcome. For those of you who just woke up, here we go. And if you're a guest today, well, then we just, you know, this is what we do because if nothing else, folks here in the you know, folks here in the congregation, they just put up with me and humor me. Ready? We are saved by. Grace. Being saved is a. Yeah. It is not a. Grace. We don't earn it. Thanks be to God, Jesus did it for us. The righteous for the unrighteous. As you're reading 1 Peter, he paid the price for us. Friends, I believe in Jesus Christ. I'm not, I don't know if Jesus descended to hell. My guess is he did not. I do know he died for me. And in that regard, he descended to the dead. Thanks be to God. I also don't know if hell exists or not, but my belief is, as best as I can understand it, is hell does exist. And that is a place for folks who choose to not know Jesus Christ. Pray for the folks you know who don't know Jesus. This is serious business. It's got eternal consequences. Thanks be to God for the incredible love of God that Jesus was one of the price for you, paid the price for you and for me. I believe that Jesus was crucified, dead, and buried. That he descended to the dead. Amen. Friends, would you pray with me? You can find the prayer on the screen behind me. Um, although I encourage you instead to close your eyes, turn your hands up to heaven, and let's talk with God as we pray. Lord God, loving Father. Lord God, loving Father. I love you. I love you. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for me. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for me. Thank you, Jesus, for forgiving me. Thank you, Jesus, for forgiving me. Grant me the courage to talk about Jesus. Grant me the courage to talk about Jesus. I pray in Jesus' name. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, let's continue to worship through the beginning of our tithes and our offerings. Thank you. fish this morning for lots of fish. It's our local food pantry.
how you provide for us and how you care for us and you love us. We give these gifts to you out of love for you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Friends, let's sing together. In number 98, I believe, off the top of my head, to God be the glory. here? No. There are no Catholics here. And then Wesley, I guess, got to be a little worried. Are there any Methodists here? Now you need to know, John Wesley was the father of Methodism. 200 and some years later <coughs> after he lived, we're still in churches <coughs> resembling what he began. And so John Wesley asked that keeper, are there any Methodists here? And the keeper's response was, no. There are no Methodists here. Then who's in heaven? Asked Wesley. The response was, people who love the Lord. And then in his dream, Wesley was taken to the other spot, or hell. And so he asked the keeper in hell, so are there any uh, Presbyterians here? Oh yes, there are Presbyterians here. Are there any Baptists here? Oh yes, there are Baptists here. Any Anglicans? Oh, there are Anglicans. Catholics? Oh, there are Catholics. <laughs> are there any Methodists here? Oh, there are Methodists. And then once they ask this question, here in hell, are there, is there anyone who loves the Lord? No. There's no one who loves the Lord. Maybe that just sums it up for us, friends. 
May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and fill you with the incredible ability to love him. May God give you peace. Amen. Amen. Amen.